Chris. Chapter 1. The Boy Left Behind. The boy does not understand. Lourdes understands, as only a mother can, the terror she is about to inflict. She knows the ache Enrique will feel, and finally the emptiness. She says nothing. She can't even look at him. Enrique has no hint of what she is going to do. What will become of him? He loves her deeply, as only a son can. Already he will not let anyone else feed or bathe him. With Lourdes, he is openly affectionate. Dame pico, mami. Give me a kiss, mom, he pleads, pursing his lips. With Lourdes, he is a chatterbox. Mira, mami. Look, mami, he says softly, asking her questions about everything he sees. Without her, he is so shy it is crushing. Slowly she walks out onto the porch. Enrique clings to her leg. Beside her, he is tiny. Lourdes loves him so much she cannot bring herself to say a word. She cannot carry his picture. It would melt her will. She cannot bear to hug him. He is five years old. They live on the outskirts of Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras. Lourdes, 24, makes money going door to door selling tortillas, used clothes, and plantains. Or she finds a spot where she can squat on the dusty sidewalk next to the downtown pizza hut and sells gum, crackers, and cigarettes out of a box. The street is Enrique's playground. A good job is out of the question. Lourdes can barely afford food for Enrique and his sister, Belki, who is seven. She has never been able to buy them a toy or a birthday cake. Her husband is gone. She cannot afford uniforms or pencils. Enrique and Belki are not likely to finish grade school. Their future is bleak. Lourdes can think of only one place that offers hope. As a seven-year-old child, she glimpsed this place on other people's television screens when she would deliver her mother's homemade tortillas to wealthy homes. On television, she saw New York City's spectacular skyline, Las Vegas's shimmering lights, Disneyland's magic castle. The flickering images were a far cry from Lourdes's childhood home, a two-room shack made of wooden slats with a flimsy tin roof. The bathroom was a clump of bushes outside. Lourdes has decided. She will leave. She will go to the United States and make money and send it home. She will be gone for one year, less with any luck, and come back to Honduras, or she will bring her children north to be with her. It is for them she is leaving, she tells herself, but she feels overpowered by guilt. Lourdes will have to split up her children. None of her family members can afford to take them both on. Belki will be left with Lourdes's mother and sisters. Enrique will be left with his father, Luis, who has been separated from Lourdes for three years. Lourdes kneels and kisses Belki, hugging her tightly, but she cannot face Enrique. He will remember only one thing that she says to him. Don't forget to go to church this afternoon. It is January 29, 1989. His mother steps off the porch. She walks away. Donde esta mi mami? Enrique cries over and over that night. Where's my mom? His mother never returns to Central America. This decides Enrique's fate. Beverly Hills. Lourdes has paid a smuggler, or coyote as they are called, to help her cross Mexico on buses. She closes her eyes and imagines herself home at dusk, playing with Enrique and Belki under a eucalyptus tree in their front yard. Tears fall. She reminds herself that if she is weak, if she does not make it, her children will keep suffering. Lourdes' smuggler sneaks her into the United States during one of the largest immigrant waves in the country's history. She enters at night through a rat-infested sewage tunnel in Tijuana, Mexico, and makes her way to Los Angeles. There, in the downtown Greyhound bus terminal, the smuggler tells Lourdes to wait while he runs a quick errand. He'll be right back. She has paid him to take her all the way to Miami. Three days pass. The smuggler does not return. Lourdes musses her filthy hair, trying to blend in with the homeless so she won't get singled out by police. She prays to God to put someone before her to show her the way. To whom can she reach out for help? Starved, she starts walking. East of downtown, she spots a small factory. On the loading dock, under a gray tin roof, women sort red and green tomatoes. Lourdes begs for work. As she puts tomatoes into boxes, she hallucinates that she is slicing open a juicy one and sprinkling it with salt. Soon she finds a job as a nanny. She moves in with a Beverly Hills couple to take care of their three-year-old daughter, their spacious home has carpet on the floors and mahogany panels on the walls. Her employers are kind. Maybe, Lourdes tells herself, if she stays long enough, they will help her become a legal resident. Every morning when the couple leaves for work, the little girl cries for her mother. Lourdes feeds her breakfast and thinks of Enrique and Belki. She asks herself, do my children cry like this? 
I'm giving this girl food instead of feeding my own children. The girl, so close to Enrique's age, is a constant reminder of him. Lourdes is filled with sadness. Many afternoons, she cannot contain her grief. She gives the girl a toy and dashes into the kitchen. There, out of sight, she lets the tears flow. She cannot take being around other people's children when hers are so far away. She decides she must find another kind of job. Confusion. It is two years since Lourdes has left. Enrique is seven. Boxes arrive back home in Tegucigalpa. They are filled with clothes, shoes, toy cars, a Robocop doll, a television. Lourdes doesn't write long letters. She's barely literate, and this embarrasses her. She tells Enrique to behave and to study hard. She has hopes for him. Graduation from high school, a career, maybe as an engineer. She pictures her son working in a crisp shirt and shiny shoes. She tells him she loves him. Enrique clings to his daddy, Luis, who dotes on him. A bricklayer, Luis takes Enrique to work and lets him, sh lets him help mix mortar. He shares a bed with Enrique and brings him apples and clothes. They live with Enrique's grandmother, Maria Marcos. Every month, Enrique misses his mother less, but he does not forget her. When is she coming for me, he asks. She'll be home soon, his grandmother assures him. Don't worry, she'll be back. But his mother does not come. Enrique's shock turns to confusion and finally anger. Her disappearance is incomprehensible. On Mother's Day, he makes a heart-shaped card at school and presses it into Maria's hand. I love you very much, Grandma, he writes. But she is not his mother. Enrique looks across the rolling hills to his old neighborhood. Belki still lives there with Lourdes's family. Enrique lives six miles away. He misses his sister. He and Belki hardly ever see each other, but they recognize one another's pain. For Belki, their mother's disappearance is just as painful. She lives with Aunt Rosa Amalia, Lourdes's sister. There are days, Belki tells Aunt Rosa Amalia, when I wake up and feel so alone. Belki is moody. Sometimes she stops talking to everyone. When Belki's disposition turns dark, her grandmother warns the other children in the house. Portense bien, porque la marea anda brava. You better behave, because the seas are choppy. On Mother's Day, Belki cries quietly, alone in her room. She struggles through the celebrations at school. Then she scolds herself. She should thank her mother for leaving. Without the money Lourdes sends for books and uniforms, Belki could not even attend school. She reminds herself of all the other things her mother ships south. Reebok tennis shoes, black sandals, the yellow bear and pink puppy stuffed toys on her bed. She finds comfort in a friend whose mother has also left for the States. She and her friend know a girl whose mother died of a heart attack. At least, they say, our moms are alive. Aunt Rosa Amalia thinks the separation has caused Belki and Enrique deep emotional problems. To her, it seems that they each struggle with an unavoidable question. How can I be worth anything if my own mother left me? Grandmother Maria Enrique's father starts dating a new woman. To her, Enrique is just another mouth to feed, a waste of money. One morning, she spills hot cocoa on Enrique and scalds him. Louis throws her out. But their separation is brief. Mom, Louise tells Grandmother Maria, I think, I can't think of anyone but that woman. Enrique's father bathes, dresses, splashes on cologne, and follows his girlfriend. He plans to move in with her and leave Enrique with Grandmother Maria. Enrique tags along as Louise leaves. He begs his father to let him come along, but Louise refuses. He tells Enrique to go back home. His father begins a new family. Enrique sees him rarely, usually by chance. In time, Enrique's love turns to hate. He doesn't love us. He loves the children he has with his wife, he tells Belki. I don't have a dad. His father notices. He looks at me as if he wasn't my son, as if he wants to strangle me, he tells Enrique's grandmother. Most of the blame, he decides, belongs to Enrique's mother. She is the one who promised to come back. Enrique and Grandmother Maria share a tiny shack, 30 feet square, in Carrizal, one of Tegucigalpa's poorest neighborhoods. Grandmother Maria built it herself with wooden slats. Enrique can see daylight through the cracks. The shack has four rooms, three without electricity. There is no running water. Gutters carry rain off the patched tin roof into two barrels. A trickle of cloudy white sewage runs past the front gate. The bathroom is a concrete-lined hole outside. Beside it are buckets for bathing. Two or three times a week, Enrique lugs buckets filled with drinking water, one on each shoulder, from the bottom of the hill up to the house. Grandmother Maria cooks plantains, spaghetti, and fresh eggs for dinner. Now and then she kills a chicken and prepares it for Enrique. In return, when she is sick, Enrique rubs medicine on her back and brings water to her in bed. Lourdes usually sends Enrique $50 a month. 
In a good month, she sends up to 100. In a bad month, nothing. There's enough food, there's enough for food, but not for school supplies and clothes, which are expensive in Honduras. There is never enough for a birthday present. But Grandmother Maria hugs him and wishes him a cheery, Feliz cumpleaños! Enrique loves to climb his grandmother's gayaba tree, but there is no more time for play. At age 10, Enrique is old enough to make money. Your mom can't send enough, Grandma Maria says, so we both have to work. On a well-worn rock nearby, Grandmother Maria washes used clothes she sells door to door. After school, Enrique sells tamales and plastic bags of fruit juice from a bucket hung by in the crook of his elbow. Tamarindo, piña, he shouts. At a local service station, he jostles among mango and avocado vendors to sell cups of diced fruit. He rides buses alone to an outdoor fruit food market. There, he stuffs tiny bags with nutmeg, curry powder, and paprika to sell, then sells them with hot wax, seals them with hot wax. Va a querer especias, he calls out. Who wants spices? He has no vendor's license, so he keeps moving, darting between carts piled with papayas in case the police are on the lookout. Younger children, five and six years old, dot the curbs, thrusting fistfuls of tomatoes and chiles at shoppers. Others offer to carry purchases of fruits and vegetables from stall to stall in rustic wooden wheelbarrows in exchange for tips. Te ayudo? May I help you? They ask shoppers. In between sales, some of the young market workers sniff glue. Enrique longs to hear Lourdes's voice. His mother's cousin is the only family member who has a telephone he can use. Because Enrique lives across town, he is not often lucky enough to be at her house when his mother phones. She does not call often. One year, she does not call at all. Better to send money, Lourdes replies, than burn it up on phone bills. But there is another reason she hasn't called. Her surroundings in the United States are nothing like the images she saw on television in Honduras. She is ashamed, she is ashamed to report how shabby her life is. Lourdes sleeps on the floor in a bedroom she shares with three other women. Her boyfriend from Honduras, Santos, joins her. Santos works as a bricklayer. Living together is less expensive than paying rent on her own. With him here, Lourdes figures she can save enough to bring her children within two years. If not, she will take whatever savings she has and return to Honduras to build a little house in the corner grocery store. Then Lourdes unintentionally gets pregnant. She struggles through the difficult pregnancy, working in a refrigerated fish packing plant, weighing and packing salmon and catfish all day. Her water breaks at five one summer morning. Lourdes's temperature shoots up to 105 degrees. She is delirious. Bring my mother, bring my mother, she cries from her hospital bed. She has trouble breathing. A nurse slips an oxygen mask over her face. Lourdes gives birth to a girl, Diana. Santos has never shown up at the hospital. He's not answering their house phone. He has gone to a bar to get drunk. Alone, Lourdes leaves the hospital wearing nothing more than a blue paper robe. She doesn't even have underwear. She sits in her apartment kitchen and sobs, longing for her two children back home, her mother, her sister, anyone familiar. Her homesickness is unbearable. Lourdes has let go from the fish packing plant after she is injured on the job. Money is tight. Santos drinks more and more. He doesn't help with the baby. Lately, when he drinks, he gets jealous and violent. I will not put up with this, Lourdes tells herself. Their arguing gets worse. Santos goes back to visit Honduras. He promises that in their home country he will invest the little they have saved. Instead, he spends it all on a long drinking binge with a 15-year-old girl on his arm. He never calls Lourdes again. Through friends, she hears that soon after returning to California, he and other Latin American workers were caught during a raid by U.S. immigration enforcement agents. He has been deported back to Honduras, but is determined to return to the United States. He never arrives. Not even his mother in Honduras knows what has happened to him. Eventually, Lourdes concludes that he has died in Mexico or drowned in the Rio Grande. On her own, Lourdes cannot make car and apartment payments. Lourdes and Diana, who is now two years old, move into a one-car garage that has been converted into an apartment. There is no kitchen. Mother and daughter share a mattress on the concrete floor. The roof leaks, the garage floods, and slugs inch up the side of the mattress and into bed. Lourdes can't always buy milk and diapers or take Di Diana to the doctor when she gets sick. Sometimes they live on emergency welfare, by which the government pays for medical care and food for people who are destitute. There are random shootings in their neighborhood. A small park near the garage is a gang hangout. When Lourdes returns home in the middle of the night, gangsters come up to her and ask her for money. 
She hands over three dollars, or sometimes five, so they will leave her alone. What would happen to her if her children died? What would happen to her children if she died? Unemployed, unable to send money to her children in Honduras, Lourdes takes the one job available, work as a fichera at a log beach bar called El Mar Azul Bar No. 1. As a fichera, Lourdes must sit at the bar, chat with male customers, and encourage them to buy encourage them to keep buying grossly overpaid drinks for her. Her first day is filled with shame. She imagines that her brothers are sitting at the bar, judging her. What if someone she knows walks into the bar and recognizes her, and word somehow gets back to her mother in Honduras? Lourdes sits in the darkest corner of the bar and begins to cry. What am I doing here, she asks herself. Is this going to be my life? For nine months, she spends night after night patiently listening to drunken men talk about their problems how they miss their wives and children left behind in Mexico. Then a friend helps Lourdes get new work, cleaning offices and houses by day and ringing up gasoline and cigarette sales at a gas station at night. Lourdes drops her daughter, Diana, off at school at 7 a.m., cleans all day, picks her up at 5 p.m., drops her at a babysitter's, then goes back to work until 2 a.m. After that, she fetches Diana and collapses into bed. She has four hours to sleep. Some of the people whose houses she cleans are kind. One woman in Redondo Beach always cooks Lourdes lunch and leaves it on the stove for her. Another woman offers, anything you want to eat, there's the fridge. God bless you, Lourdes says to each of them. Other bosses seem to take pleasure in her humiliation. One wealthy woman demands that Lourdes scrub her living room and kitchen floors on her knees instead of cleaning them with a mop. The cleaning liquids cause the skin to slough off Lourdes's knees, which sometimes bleed. The work also makes Lourdes's arthritis worse. She walks like an old lady some days. The woman never even offers Lourdes a glass of water. There are good months, though, when Lourdes can earn $1,200 cleaning offices and homes. She takes extra jobs, one at a candy factory for two twenty-five dollars an hour. Besides the cash for Enrique, every month, she sends $50 each to her mother and Belki. Those are her happiest moments, when she can wire money. Her greatest dread is when there is no work and she can't. Then, being in the United States, so far away from home, feels pointless. To her children, the money Lourdes sends is no substitute for her presence. Belki's furious about the new baby, Diana. Their mother might lose interest in her and Enrique now that she has another child, and caring for Diana will cost money that Lourdes should be saving to reunite them in Honduras. For Enrique, each telephone call grows more strained. Their talk is clipped and anxious. When are you coming home? Enrique asks. Lourdes avoids answering his question directly. Instead, she promises they will be together again very soon. Then, for the first time, something occurs to him. If she will not come home, maybe he can go to her. Neither he nor his mother realizes it yet, but this kernel of an idea will take root. From now on, whenever Enrique speaks to her, he ends by saying, I want to be with you. Come home, Lourdes' own mother begs her on the telephone. It may only be beans, but you will always have food here. Lourdes' pride forbids it. How can she justify leaving her children if she returns empty-handed? She makes plans to become a resident of the United States and bring her children legally. She spends a total of $3,850 on three immigration counselors who promise help, but the counselors never deliver. Some are just con artists who steal her money. Lorda scolds herself for not dating an American who asked her out long ago. She could have married him, gotten citizenship, maybe even had children here by now. Lorda seriously considers hiring a smuggler um, Lorda seriously considers hiring a smuggler to bring the children, but fears the danger. The coyotes are often alcoholics or drug addicts. She can't imagine leaving Enrique and Belki in the hands of a stranger. Her own smuggler abandoned her. Lourdes is continually reminded of the risks. One of her best friends in Los Angeles paid for a smuggler to bring her sister from El Salvador. During her journey, the sister called to give regular updates on her progress through Mexico. Then she, the calls stopped. Two months later, Lourdes's friend hears from the man who was among the group headed north. The boat to Mexico was overloaded. It tipped over. All but four drowned. Some bodies were swept out to sea. Others, including that of the missing sister, were buried along the beach. When they unearth her body on a beach in Mexico, she is still wearing her high school graduation ring. Another friend is panic-stricken when her three-year-old son is caught by Border Patrol agents as a smuggler tries to cross him into the United States. For a week, Lourdes' friend doesn't know what's become of her toddler. For Lourdes, the disappearance of her ex-boyfriend, Santos, hits closest to home. 
Do I want to have them with me so badly, she asks herself of her children, that I'm willing to risk their losing their lives? Besides, she does not want Belky or Enrique to come to California. There are too many gangs, drugs, and crimes. The danger aside, Lourdes does not have enough money for a smuggler. The cheapest coyote charges $3,000 per child. A top smuggler will bring a child by plane for 10000 She would have to save enough to bring both children at once. If not, the one left in Honduras will think she loves him or her less. Enrique despairs. He will simply have to do it himself. He will go find her. He will sneak on top of trains, as he has heard so many people migrating to the United States do. I want to come, he tells her. Don't even joke about it, she says. It is too dangerous. Be patient. Be patient.